bottom couple for me. Yeah. Um. So the name of the project here reflects all of the ways that cobalt is uh, processed. So it can be processed by, by cutting, by boxing, by bailing, by stretching, and all of those things are um, used in different ways. I was thinking about cobalt a lot and I was so fascinated with how um, the color is used. So when cobalt it is in chemical form and it's heated up to about 3000 degrees, it can transform into this intense blue uh, when it cools. So people make glass with that and porcelain and, and other things and um, it's just a pigment for paint and that I think was when I when I would see stuff like that I realized that this is something that I really wanted to explore more and figure out where it comes from and what else it's used for. These are the many uses of cobalt so you can see that they're used for permanent mag magnets to salts to glass and metal alloys, rechargeable batteries, nuclear power plants, jet engines. Um, this is all the military equipment as it trickles down to here. Um, and then you can think about the economics so you can see how these two, economics and extraction, are inextricably linked. And you can see how when, um, how the economics just directly relates to what is being produced and what cobalt's being most used for. So these things, they start out here and then they just bring them in with machines and then they put them into the baler and just crush it down. They sort it first, so they have all the aluminum and all the steel and um, all the alloys separated so because they're worth different amounts of money. Look at how expensive the cobalt is. Same. By the metric ton. Yeah, yeah, not by the pound. So everybody works off a margin, so I'll say, okay. you know, my guy will say copper today is this. See, here's the brasses, and you start looking at the brasses down here, 70, 30, rock. When I get to come to a place like this, I really think about how uh, interconnected it is around the world, and how this is like a symbol for a site of globalization. Um, what we see is like some part in a, an object's life and the object had a story behind it. Um, we don't know exactly what it is and we can maybe create it or we can research it from clues that we can find. And that was what the workshop was about, is um, trying to find the clues on the objects that people brought. So we have these colored pencils and the idea with just doing a drawing on these small note cards is to do something that you could do with a photograph but to take more time with it. and. I think remember it a little bit more. You'll remember the details potentially more than if you photographed it. After you do a simple drawing, then I'm going to ask you to pass the drawing to your neighbor and tell your neighbor the story of the object, where you got it, how you got it, what it means to you. If it, if it means no, absolutely nothing, then you have to be creative and make up a story. There can be some fiction, too. That's OK. And then your neighbor will write down the story on the back of that card. So I'll give you five minutes to draw, and then Institute for Humanities is going to take this site, and we'll have a, like a documentation of all these objects going forward in the bundle and also outside of the bundle on the web. After we do some documentation and you start your blog post, I thought it would be great to, um, you know, you can tell the personal story and we can also get into the supply chain of it if it makes sense for the particular object. Objects are buried all of the time, but not often as a symbol of reverence to the land they came from, or to respect the important histories they contain. What stories do we want to tell through objects that are meaningful to us, or through those objects we may not see much meaning in, but they still contain it? What clues are we leaving behind for those who come after us? And in this regard, can we proclaim these to be gifts that we would also want to receive? Justice and sustainability both demand that we do not use more resources than we need. Restraint and resource use and living with nature's limits are preconditions for social justice.